Welcome to SBCA's Lumber Connection Podcast, where we discuss today's market and explore tomorrow's trends. Here's our host, Molly Butts. Hello and welcome to Lumber Connection. It's the week of October 3rd, 2022, and I'm back in the home studio with my regular experts, Justin Binning and Ken Timmons. Both Justin and Ken are from American International Forest Products, or AIFP. Welcome back to the podcast, gentlemen. Hey there, Molly. Hey, how's it going over there? It's going. Yeah, phenomenal day in Oregon. It's beautiful. All right. Yeah, it's been beautiful here, too. I was just telling you guys about my farmer behind my house uh, doing a little bit of harvesting today. So if you guys hear any weird noises, you'll know what they are. Uh, Beyond that, why don't we just jump right in? Now, we were talking a little bit beforehand, and it sounds like you've got a few things to say today. So let's start with an update on the lumber market over the last couple of weeks. We had some change there for a minute when in talking yellow pine lumber, we had a uh, certainly a bottom that had been set in on six inch, eight inch, 10 inch. Um, That was nice to see. Uh, we had a solid uprint for a couple, two plus, I guess, close to three weeks now. Um, and now it's kind of uh, leveled up a bit. Two by four and two by 12 continue to kind of decline and, and find its descent. Um, supply over overwhelming demand still at this point. Um, with that said, there's still trading going on every every single day and orders are getting done. I be it they've definitely been on the counter in those lengths. Now that change, it feels like, has happened over the last... I'd say last week in terms of the two by six through two by 10 um, product line, it, it started to feel like the mills are giving way a little bit. You know, it's starting to uh, starting to stack up again um, in certain places um, throughout different regions. And so it feels like six inch, eight inch and 10 inch are hitting the pause button again um, in terms of price escalation. So if we flatline for a couple of weeks, maybe we start to dip down, seeing some price decline. If mills have got to get some things, they got to keep it moving. Um, it wouldn't shock me. And I'm talking primarily in, in our on grade number two, number one type material. Not everything is, is equal right now. Um, if we talk stress grades, MSR, extremely tight. And that's been a story for quite some time now. Yeah. It has not changed. So if you're looking for MSR, you probably have felt the hardships in trying to source it. Um, I know we certainly have. And um, if you can find anything, you feel lucky that day. So I think that's a mixture. People are like, why did, where did MSR go? Why did it get so tight? You know, I used to be able to get it and been thinking about that question. And I think there's a multitude of reasons why we've seen stress grade material, um, particularly in yellow pine, become tight. One is a bit of seasonality, right? Summertime weather has an impact in its, you definitely will typically see a decrease in MSR production. I think that's one. I think mills have capitalized on the increase of lumber pricing over the journey that we've been on. And I think you're seeing a lot more of that material contracted. When you talk to, to trust manufacturers, component manufacturers, business is still very good very strong and most have order significant order files ranging from three to six months and some longer um, they've got to have material they don't have an option to to not have it they've got to have material and so again i i think that mills have have contracted a lot more of that product to the end user lack of production so I don't believe that the MSR, as we've grown the South base in terms of overall production, we haven't added a significant amount of actual stress grade production. What we have done over this course period of time, the last several years, is continue to lose stress grade material production out of other producing regions, i.e. Western Canada. Great example. And so you've got, you know, folks that used to use spruce, now they're forced to use pine. You've got other baskets, geographical reference points is now pulling from the same basket of wood that hasn't actually grown much in terms of overall productions in that, in that particular, you know, stress grade, for example. And so you've got more people pulling from the same and no growth there. So I think that's been, been hampering it as well. Um, and then you've got mills dealing with day-to-day issues and labor has obviously been a hot topic for a long time now. Um, and mills, a lot of mills that are producing the MSR have been facing those challenges and not everybody makes it right. Not every sawmill in the South is making an MSR braid. And so I think it's a multitude of factors that have 
um, convene to, you know, make it a very tight market in, in terms of the stress grade. Is stress graded lumber a lot more expensive to manufacture? Like, is the process of stress grading it that does that add a, a component to it that is astronomical in some way? Or I mean, or is the equipment that you'd need to do that? I'm thinking about that versus visually graded lumber and trying to wrap my arms around, around why if there's a shortage of it or less of it than we need that we would make an effort to make more. <laughs> sure. Um, Katie, you have any insight from your standpoint on that? I know a few things to depends on the log base, right? So if, to make a bad reference, if we're talking potatoes and French fries, your MSR pieces have no skin on them. They're all weighing free. It's going to yep. come out of the jacket board of the wood, kind of the outer, not the, not the heart, so to speak, from the inside. Um, there's just less available. And to that effect, you also need a certain type of log going into the sawmill. Get it, right? Okay. A lot of a lot of logs going into sawmills these days are small diameter, you know, four, four five, six, seven inch versus yep. a lot of MSR. You know, you're going to need a 12 inch or larger diameter log. So it's just- And that's age? Is that age related for the, I'm assuming? Um. Yeah, <laughs> things, yeah, age, geographic region, right? Like say, for example, okay. you go- like uh, to some trust guys, they love black spruce from, you know, far northern Canada, where okay. it's, you know, high elevation grown log where the fiber is so dense that okay. it'd be like a DSS grade or, a, you know, 2800 MSR or something like that, because okay. the tree literally doesn't grow out that far. And, and therefore the fibers are tighter and it's stronger. Yep. So there's a few different things that go into it. Uh, obviously age, right? The quicker you cut it, the, the thinner your log going in the mill. Interesting. And not everybody can run it, right? And so some mills don't. And the mills that are sure. up, again, I just, we haven't had the growth in that product mix. Yeah. Not significantly enough to get in line where demand is. Our trusts and component manufacturers are busy. So out of the West, yeah, for very, sure. very Kenny. similarly, I wish I could speak as eloquently as Justin Golly. That makes me want to open a trust shop that uses pine today. Uh, <laughs> but big picture, very similar, right? Big picture, market is soft, uh, fur species, dug for him for white fur, have maintained a higher price than a lot, you know, than spruce or pine or, or that sort of thing. So it feels like there's more room for it to come off is w what should be happening, but it's really just not taking place. There's a very big disconnect from where customers want to buy and where mills want to sell. You know, the market is the market, right? There's an equilibrium point between supply and demand, and that's where the quote unquote market is. But I think there's an expectation out there that the price, especially when we talk about cord stock material for trust guys, mm -hmm. there's an expectation that's going to keep bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. One thing I don't know if a lot of fur users are aware of is the price of fur logs has gone up tremendously. I mean, much more than in years past. So the bottom of the market or the floor of where pricing is, is higher than a lot of people expect. When we're talking about labor and whatnot, obviously large national news that warehouser has been on a four week strike yeah. and kind of creating a two tiered market in the West, mm -hmm. Western producers of fur in that uh, dry species are still flat to down. They're coming off a little bit. Green species are actually trending back up in price. Those at bottom. You know, so expectations are all over the place. There's a big range of what people want versus what's reasonable. And that's totally okay and healthy for the market to have some tension there. But I'd, I'd agree with Justin. I mean, it, if you're looking for standard and better two by four, probably not going to be the hardest job of your day. If you're looking for two by eight high grade MSR or for two by four, one and better 1800 or select truck, and there's some challenges. While the ball is in the buyer's court, so to speak, you know, it's not a wide open layup to the bucket. You still got to, you know, be pretty resourceful and do your shopping, uh, explore options. And set. Well, I've seen a lot of species substitutions right now, whether it's guys okay. that can't get high grade 2400 yellow pine looking at Doug Fur 2250 or, or fur guys that are now switching to, to you know, from Doug to him or, or to spruce. There's a lot of switching going on, um, which I recommend if you, if your designers are, comfortable switching species and you have enough room to inventory multiple species there's nothing wrong with which, which is really kind of cool in its own right in, in the terms of that you know i again i haven't been in the business that long since 2010 but like when i started like that wasn't a thing like it just wasn't 
Um, didn't matter. Even if it was a big discount, people just wouldn't. It's like granddaddy used Bruce and he used this for that. Like that's what we use, you know, and it was like, didn't matter. But now I think, especially since this, the, you know, post pandemic era. I was going to ask, was this COVID related really more than anything? Yeah, yeah. I think it has where it forced so many people to buy some, they had to have fiber or, you know, it was yeah. a fiber thing. It was like, you give me the wood. You know, it's like, I'm looking for. 16s. It's like, well, I, I got these, you know, two by six tens. Well, I'll take those. You know, I, 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 you know, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll, yeah. We'll, <laughs> um, so I think this has led now to a lot more people open to that idea and can and will easily switch between products. And I know we've talked about that with the Southern Yellow Pine. Yeah. Well, and weather wise, right? Today's October 5th, going in the winter, cooler weather. You know, the yeah. species swap, it doesn't hurt you as bad as normal. Right. Like uh, you could take any species of Phoenix right now. It's not as hot. It's not going to bow on you as bad. Or pine will travel further out of its traditional market than it does during the summer. You know, the, okay. the ability to swap species is greater over the next six months. So more of an option than it would be other times of the year. That's good to know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Ken, you said uh, strike, obviously, but that's very different than a curtailment. Are you guys hearing any more about any further curtailments from other places in the market right now? Well, I don't want to, you know, be a speculator necessarily, especially on this platform. Um, I don't sure. want to, but um, I would caution say, to be had. <laughs> yeah, I would say don't be shocked, right? I mean, you, you just can't. Versus, if you if you look at uh, the CME where the board is at, the cost for them to be profitable. I mean, they're they're there, right? To be unprofitable at this point sure. uh, in terms of where lumber pricing is at, which is published on Random Lakes. Um, and obviously the futures board is accessible to anyone to be able to, to see that information, but from an overall cost of profitability, they're there, they're, they're at a, at a point where it's, it's not profitable anymore. So yeah. um, the likelihood of seeing that is, is very high and it would not shock me, but um, right. I do think we have some, some, a lot of positives, you know, we yearned for a sense of stability. Mm -hmm for a long time here, right? Since yeah. 2020, welcome, here you are, you know, you, you've got it. I think that we're, we're entering our new normal, we're setting in new, new pricing standards and, and I think we're setting in a, a trading zone and a range. Um, I think the volatility is, uh, big time volatility is less and less. Um, I think we're gonna get into more traditional type swings in the market. Yeah. And you may have some outliers from time to time, without a doubt. But I'm talking about the overall basket, I think, is is on pretty solid footing right now in terms of uh, being able to scale pricing. Well, I, I'd ask the question before we got on and I wouldn't have asked it, but just only to lend to this conversation, you know, would the effects of Hurricane Ian for some reason have, you know, be a, a trigger for the market? And we talked through, you know, the idea that not yeah. really, obviously, that's sort of a slow moving recovery. Um, certainly thinking about all of those folks going through that process right now and hope that that, that happens more quickly than it might. But uh, that was another question that I had for you regarding triggers. But you said something really interesting that I really liked, which is sort of this lack of emotion in the market right now. The things that would be a trigger like a hurricane or the, the real strike or something like that. You know, that's an interesting concept for us to talk about. I yeah, think. Well, I think we've been emotionally beat out um, over what we've gone through over the last going on close to three years. Um, I use the, 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 the word desensitized, right? I feel like. A global by, pandemic will do that to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, realized, and I don't want to call it, you know, it's careless isn't the right word, but, it, but there's no, there's no sense of, or, or sense of urgency. There's no, there's no real worry in terms of pricing or something getting away from them. Um, there's no fear. Right. And I, and I talk yeah. about this all fear, new and greed, right? Sorry, yep. listen, I sound like a broken record, <laughs> but it's important. And, and, sure. and you have to look at those things when you look at a market and gauge where each one of those factors is at. And, and right now, again, you know, I don't want to keep beating on the same point here, but there's no fear of, of getting, being able to get lumber. There's no fear of the price. Their needs can be met any single day. Um, again, you got some outliers here and there, you know, if you're looking for some two by 10 MSR, you know, I said, lesson, I feel your pain um, or some other <laughs> stress grades. Uh, but 
Well, that's where we're at. I mean, and, and so when I say we're desensitized, there's not a like, oh, hey, gosh, you know, rail strike, curtailments, hurricanes. These used to be things that would spur emotion and spur yeah. action. And now it's, I don't care, you know, and not, I don't care that it's a hurricane and people, but no, of course, not. in terms of pricing the lumber, whatever, like yeah. I just, I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm going to buy lumber the way that I'm buying lumber right now. And I don't, I don't care if that happens. I still feel like I can go out and get whatever I want. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I liked hearing you guys say today, it's something I feel like I brought up a lot a year ago, you know, like, oh, what's the new normal look like? And every time it was sort of like, oh, don't say that. We don't even know. There's never going to be a new normal because it felt like that, right? Like we don't have any idea when that will ever happen if it ever happens again. So it was refreshing today to have you guys say that maybe we're kind of settling into a new normal finally. So it feels good from a lot of fronts. You know, another bright uh, note that I would say is trucking is as good as I've seen it in a long time. Good. You knew that was on my list to ask. It always is. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a huge part of obviously the, the cost of goods and, and, and the way we move product, obviously. But it's it's good as I've seen it in a long time. It's trending right in the back, the right direction. Fuel is battling and, and it looks like fuel prices are rising on the average up again. But as far as overall availability of capacity, that's helping, right? And that's even with fuel prices, again, historically, we're paying a lot more than what we normally have or would on, on, you know, any given lane. But the fact that the available capacity right now is outstripping the demand needed is, is creating a, an environment where prices are going down and guys are competing now. As opposed to, well, if you want my truck, here's what it's going to cost you. Now you got four trucks fighting for the same load, right? So it's creating a, of fresh air. <laughs> yeah, it's creating an environment where we're getting better, better deals on freight. So our yeah. prices are getting more stable. Prices are definitely, I think, more consumable and mixed with freight o- overall, leading to some really good values out in the marketplace. Nice. Well, what do you guys have to say about the next couple of weeks before we get together again? Any advice to lend to the, uh, Component manufacturing folks. So take a deep breath. Uh, we made it back to the new normals. So you don't necessarily need to worry about lumber as much as you might have before. No need to wake up at 3 a.m. worrying about that <laughs> truck of whatever, like Justin and I do all the time. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's a good opportunity when when things are quiet in that sphere of your component manufacturing business to focus on the other parts, right? You've got a constant there. It's, it's no longer... The guy down the street bought it cheaper than me, so he's getting all the business. Now you can focus more on your customer relationships or your quality or, you know, an end of the summer barbecue for your labor team or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, you know, enjoy, enjoy a quick second of fresh air, smell the roses and uh, focus on the other parts of your business that might have been overlooked during the chaos. Yeah. And I'd say it's obviously um, from a sales standpoint, I'm getting prospected by like mills are calling me. I don't remember the last time a mill called me to like, Hey, you're looking for anything today. <laughs> like, I, and it's happening. <laughs> well, you, 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 you added a lot in terms of, you know, especially in our segment, the wholesale side, there's a lot of people selling lumber, a lot of new mills, a lot, of, everybody needs to sell product. Remember those that remembered you in the tough times. That's what I would say. You're going to have a lot of, a lot of people calling, trying to sell wood. There's less orders to go around. And, um, you know, just, I guess I'd say, you know, remember who took care of you, you know, and, and got you through the tough times. And even though a guy may call you with a cheap number and he's, you know, hadn't been trading wood that long and he's out, you know, trying to offload stuff or this and that, make sure you always just give your, your good guys a, a look at it, make sure that they can try to do that. And I'm not trying to dishearten any of our young people in the industry. I think it's fantastic, but I, it's easy to forget where you were at, you know, I think at times, uh, not too long ago and, and, uh, we were all battling. So just, uh, love your lumber trader or your, whoever it is you buy your, your, your wood from. Sounds great. Good advice. And I think, you know, that goes back to what we've been talking about for a long time. Just keep building those relationships. Awesome. Well, I think that wraps up our episode for this week. Justin, Ken, thank you so much for your continued expertise and enthusiasm. I've enjoyed our time together. I'll be a brief and look forward to the next installment of Lumber Connection. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, Molly. We'll see you in a couple weeks. This has been a Lumber Connection podcast by SBCA. 
If you have a question you'd like a guest to answer on a future podcast, send it to podcast at sbcacomponents.com.